Come with me on that journey. Speaking of journey, we're in a series called Once Upon a Land, and this is a series that uh, really is going to be focusing on you guys gaining an understanding, me trying to convince you, me showing you the facts that the things that we read about, the things we know about in the Bible are real. They're real. They actually happen. These are true things. But that's hard to wrap our head around. It's hard to grasp, especially when we look at some of the stories and some of the events that are recorded in the Bible. That can be really hard to kind of uh, accept. It's a hard pill to swallow at times. And so sometimes the Bible, and and we're going to start with kind of this thing called a, a fairy tale. Sometimes the Bible starts kind of as a fairy tale. And a fairy tale always starts with the, the line, once upon a time. And so what I'm trying to do here with this is, is whether you believe in the Bible or you don't, especially if you don't, let's just all gather around. First, let's define what a fairy tale is, and then I'll show you how the Bible actually is really, really close to what a fairy tale is. So a fairy tale always starts with once upon a time. I think we all know that when we read, uh, growing up reading the fairy tales, they have three things that are in common. Every fairy tale has three things that are in common. The first thing that they have, interesting characters. All right, so I grew up watching Dumbo. Dumbo, uh, an elephant with big ears, a very interesting character. Uh, Shrek is a very interesting character. The donkey on Shrek, very interesting character. Even if we look at um, Little Red Riding Hood, you know, that's wearing the red cloak, that's a very interesting character. But fairy tales have these interesting characters because that's what makes us want to read them. You know, Jack and, and the Beanstalk, that's all very interesting, full of interesting characters. Then it's going to have supernatural events. So again, thinking about Jack and the Beanstalk, planting some beans and a stalk growing up all the way to the heavens and, and Jack climbing up and seeing giants, that is a supernatural event. It's not something that should happen. It's not something we can wrap our head around. So it is therefore a supernatural event, Jack and the Beanstalk. Now, the last thing that every fairy tale has is an important life lesson. You know, it's teaching some kind of lesson. Don't bully, love people for who they are, don't judge a book by its cover. But many of them end with the same life lesson, which is, you know, it all ended happily ever after. And so that's kind of your formula for a fairy tale. Now, a Bible, or the Bible, not a Bible, but the Bible, in fact, this Bible that I have up here that I'm going to read to you guys from today is a lot like a fairy tale. In fact, if we look at the Bible, it has the same three things that a fairy tale does. See, a Bible has interesting characters in it. If you look even just specifically at the New Testament, you've got Peter who gave up a fishing business to follow a rabbi. I mean, that's an interesting guy, and a lot of Peter's stories are very interesting. You've got Matthew. He was a tax collector. Matthew would end up leaving a very lucrative business and following Jesus. That's, that's a very interesting character. Even if you look at, at the Pharisees and, uh, and the Sadducees, you know, they're, they're very interesting. My, my son, Benjamin, um, who, who's uh, three, three and a half, almost four years old, he, he loves talking about the Pharisees. So he talks about uh, the Philistines and the Pharisees because he's really into David and Goliath. So if you think about an almost four-year-old trying to say the word Philistine and trying to say the word Pharisee, it's, it's quite funny. So he'll say the Philistines and the Pharisees. And so I'm trying to get him to, to take Pharisee all the way to Parasite, but I haven't gotten him quite all the way there yet. But he'll talk about, you know, those to him are the bad guys. And, 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 and God's army, he'll say, is going to conquer the Philistines. And, and Jesus is going to overcome the, the Pharisees as he says it. So that, those are interesting characters for him. And, and, and they're supernatural events. You know, when you look at Jesus walking on water, when you look at Jonah getting swallowed by a whale, you know, this, when you look at Lazarus being raised by the dead, those are all supernatural events. And then you have these really important life lessons. You know, life lessons are, are something that you can take away from, and the Bible is full of those. You know, if you look in the book of Proverbs, it gives you a ton of life lessons. A lot of people will read Proverbs. If you're ever interested in, in diving into a book in the Bible, take Proverbs. There's 30 of them. Read one a day and, and work through that book. And all of that is, is, is good life lessons, the teachings of Jesus. And he spells it out quite clearly. There was a verse where Jesus is actually asked, what is the greatest commandment? 
And Jesus said, he just narrows it down for you. We don't have to argue about it. He says, love your neighbor and love God. So that's a great life lesson. So as we sit right here, and, and the journey that we all start on together here, before we move any further forward in this journey, is that the Bible has these three things. Fairy tales have these three things. So as it sits right now, we all are, are, are believing, or we can all just agree and say that, that fairy tales and the Bible are the exact same. I, I know some of you squirmed. I saw some people just, I uh, can't believe you said that out loud. But fairy tales and the Bible are the same. Now, I know that for, for you, a lot of you are members, people that have grown up in church. I mean, you know that that's not true. But you know what? There's a lot of people that didn't grow up in church that don't necessarily know that that's true. Or at least they don't think it. They don't believe it. You know, you know, they haven't been convinced or they haven't seen that the Bible is any different from a bunch of fairy tales. And, and I, I hope that in this message, this maybe points you to considering that the Bible is a lot different than fairy tales. In fact, when we look at, okay, what's the difference between a fairy tale and the Bible? There are many differences. But the one that we're going to focus on, especially in this series, is we're going to focus on location. You know, the, the fairy, fairy tales, you can't visit Princess Elsa's castle. You can't go to, uh, you know, the, the, the woman in the, that lived in the shoe. You can't go visit that shoe. You can't visit the locations in fairy tales. You can visit locations in Israel that we know for a fact are part of the, the events that are recorded in the Bible. You can absolutely go visit those. And there are some locations that, that we know that this happened exactly in this spot. And there are some locations that we know that this happened kind of in this area. And then there's some events that have locations that we kind of know happened, but we don't exactly know where and where that happened. You know, if you think about where did Noah's Ark land after the flood? I mean, people say they have an idea, but they don't know the exact location of that. So we don't, what we're going to be focused on this week and over the next two weeks is these are the locations that we know exactly where an event happened. It's not maybe around here. It's exactly right here in this place. And so that's why the name of this, this series is so significant, is that a fairy tale says once upon a time, but for our series, looking at the Bible, it's once upon a land. And there's one more thing that, that a location or having a provable location helps us with, and, and, and that's the moral of the story. So every fairy tale has a moral to the story. This is the thing that's supposed to make you better. It's supposed to help you have something that you take away from this. And you feel like, I'm a better person. I can be a better person. I can apply this truth. I can apply this knowledge to my life. And I can come out, you know, a better person for it. Now, for example, you know, I gave this example in the first service. And I got absolutely butchered because I used the wrong word for it. Who knew there was a difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Right? Okay? <laughs> Yeah, many of you don't. You're just laughing like, ha, ah, you dummy. I can't believe that you didn't know the difference to it. Well, you know, you're lucky I didn't quiz you when you walked in the door. So the fairy tale is that the tortoise, because apparently a turtle swims in the sea, that the tortoise and the hare, all you that are smiling at me when I said that, I know. I Listen, don't judge me, okay? Because I'll pray about you, not for you. I'll pray about you. No, I'm kidding. So the tortoise and the hare, tortoise, land turtle, that's a fairy tale. The tortoise and the hare, it, it's an event that happened where, where there was a race. The tortoise obviously goes very slow. The hare, a, a rabbit, it goes very fast. And so they're going to race. Obviously, the rabbit should win the race, but the rabbit doesn't win the race because it was a little bit cocky, a little bit arrogant. I don't know if any of you were watching rugby yesterday. I've got a son He's upstairs right now running tech. He plays rugby for Ronda Bosch under 16A. And there was a, a point against Bishops. It was Bish Bosch, you know, the big game. First seven or eight minutes of that game, I thought, there's a bunch of hares on the field here, and the tortoise is about to run away with this game. Ronda Bosch better wake up. And eventually they did. But in this, uh, in this fairy tale, the tortoise, slow and steady, and the tortoise wins the race, Right? So the moral of the story between the tortoise and the hare is that slow and steady wins the race. 
And so we can apply that moral to our lives, and it makes us better for it. And we know that we can apply that. We know that that makes us better. We know that that's a good thing. But our email, our inboxes, the notifications on our phone, the number of messages that we have and WhatsApp, the, the busyness of our schedules, all that stuff in our life actually points to and shows us that we don't really apply slow and steady wins the race. Especially if you think about your marriage as a race, your life as a race, your capacity for work and for management, for leadership, all of those things as a race. You know, we're trying to see how far and how fast we can get, how quickly we can get there. We're like the hare. See, if, if, a, if a moral comes from a fairy tale, it has no real power over us. It has no real hold or even authority in our life. But if a moral comes from an event that happened, then that's something that we can allow to have real power, real authority over our lives. And in fact, you know, I want to state the obvious here, and it's this real things happen in real places. So real things happen in real places. Today we're looking at a real place, and in this real place, a real thing happened. Now, what this does is it affords us an additional opportunity, because this is all about, this is all about checking facts. It's all about making sure, did this really happen, did this not happen? Because I started you guys out saying that the Bible and a fairy tale are the same. And I can say that because I'm going to take you on a journey, and I'm going to show you that the Bible is not like a fairy tale. It's completely completely believable because it's a real, real thing. And so real things happen in real places. Real events are recorded in the Bible, and those events in the Bible can then be checked to see if they really happened. In fact, you can always fact-check events. And by fact-checking these events, you can actually look at them on account with the actual elements of a location. So you can fact check events in an account with the actual elements of a location. Meaning, what you read in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, you can actually take that scripture, that text, take outside sources. You can take what people outside the Bible, outside the church. You can take cultural documents. You can take uh, royal documents. You can take things that people scribed in people's journals. And you can see that they all line up and they all point to the same thing. And so today's location that we're visiting, today's land that we're going to, is a town called Capernaum. Capernaum is a really significant place. Now, I don't know if you know this place, but if you don't, welcome along for our journey today. Capernaum is, is a significant place when it comes to the Bible. And I want to give you a little bit of background on it before we jump into what happened in Capernaum. So Capernaum as a city, I want to show you where this is located here. So I'm pulling up a map of, of all of kind of Judea and Israel here. And this is so kind of interesting to me. I think they're going to put the map up on the, the side screens and the back screen for you so you can see it. But, but here what you have is, okay, who knows? I, I see all you that judge me about the, the turtle thing. I want to be listening to see if you know this stuff. Okay, what, what, what is this here? What's this body of water? Ha, you don't know, you guys. This is the Mediterranean Sea. This right here is, is Egypt and Africa. Over here, you've got the desert. Up here, you have Europe. Over here, you've got Asia. Now, when you think about the ancient world, you think about the, the ancient world and the known world to the ancient world, this is kind of their square. This is what they knew. This was kind of... Where, where humanity really kind of... I, mean, I know there were people in other places in the world, but, but this is where the Romans were. This is where the empires were. This is where people were conquering. This is where people were, were fighting for. And what was so significant about this place is, is simple geography. If you live here, down here in Africa, and you want to go up to here in Asia for trade, for, for money, for, for whatever it is, you have to go through this very significant strip of green here in the middle. If you want to launch out into the Mediterranean, you have to come through this significant green there in the middle. In fact, I, I read, and, and now I can't, I'll be honest with you, I can't exactly remember the number, but there is, my, my brain wants to say 50 million, but I don't know if that's true, but there is a massive migration of birds, that, that I can say confidently, that cannot fly over the ocean and can't fly over the desert and still flies through this very significant strip that we today call, call Israel. 
And, and, and in that, that whole strip there, which encompasses even more than, than just Israel, still today people are fighting for that. I mean, I think we all know that. Because it was significant then, it's significant now. But people understood back then that, if, that what happened here and who was in control of what happened there had control, they had influence over almost everything that was happening kind of in the known world at that time. So that's why this is so significant. And then inside this, this little area here, there's a tiny little blip up here. And that is located in a place called, called Galilee. And they'll put a picture on the screen of, of Galilee for you. And this is a place called Galilee, and it contains in it the Sea of Galilee. These are things that happen in the Bible. See, the Bible talks about the Sea of Galilee. It even gives measurements of how far away is the Sea of Galilee from Jerusalem. And guess what? Those measurements are true. If, when they measure that out, it's accurate. The Sea of Galilee is the place where Jesus walked on water. It's the place where uh, Jesus fed the 5,000. This is where a lot of miracles happened here. And, and in Galilee, and then specifically in the Sea of Galilee, there's a, a, a town, a village. And, and that's what we call Capernaum. And it's in the northwest corner of the sea here. And, and they'll show you a, a picture so that you can see it here. And, and this is a modern day picture. A modern day picture of Capernaum. And here you, you'll, you'll kind of see as an aerial, you know, it's just this, this one little block of, of stuff right here on the ocean. And I've got a, a close-up view for you guys here. It's important that you see this here because, again, this is why I'm trying to help build context to why this is not a fairy tale. Why the things we read in the Bible are not fairy tales. They are real. These things really happen. So here you have this beautiful picture of, of Capernaum. And all these little blocks and, and squares that you see, you know, those were houses that people lived in. And you know what? Capernaum was Jesus' home village. He was born in Nazareth, but he moved. He left Nazareth, and he moved and he settled in Capernaum. This is where Jesus lived. A lot of Jesus' ministry happened here. Like I said, this is where the man was lowered through the roof that was paralyzed. Not only did he heal him from being paralyzed, he forgave him of his sins. This is where Peter's mother-in-law was healed. Peter had this mother-in-law, and, and this, this is why you know Jesus is a loving God, because he healed someone's mother-in-law. He actually really loved her, or he was really mad at Peter. But either way, it led him to healing Peter's mother-in-law. So Jesus did miracles in this place. You know, he, he was known in this place, and, and in fact... Yeah, as we'll see towards the end of today's kind of message, Capernaum also is known to be a place that had very little faith. In fact, it's quoted that if Capernaum, if the miracles that happened in Capernaum had happened in Sodom, which if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a town in the Old Testament that had so much sin in it, and, and, and they tried to spare Sodom and tried to get them to repent, and God ended up just destroying the whole city, and that Abraham and Lot and Lot's wife turned and looked at it and she turned into salt. You know, that's Sodom. But it's actually said that, that if the things that happened in Capernaum had happened in Sodom, even Sodom would have turned towards Jesus and it would still be standing. And Capernaum was a place of very little faith. It was Jesus' home. It was also a fishing village. And it also played a, a very important role in commerce because it had a highway that went right next to it, a trade route that went right next to it. So that's a little bit of background about Capernaum. And then if you see here in the middle, there's this kind of stop sign looking uh, building. And what that is, is it's, it's a Byzantine church that's built on top of what they know to be Peter's house. And, and, and it's not, maybe it's here, maybe it's there. Let's just pick a spot in the middle and build a roof over it. No, they, they know that that's where Peter was from. And then if you look at this other square building that's off to the side. I've got another close-up view of it that they'll put up here for you. This is the, the synagogue. So Capernaum had a synagogue. Now, this synagogue is quite unique, quite special. See, the original would have been built around 30, 70 A.D. This one was built about 300 A.D. So this one was built after Jesus' time. But it was built in a way that replicated the temple or the synagogue that would have been there when Jesus was there. And in fact... It was built exactly on the same footprint. And we know that because of this amazing kind of archaeological kind of source and dig here. We'll show you on the next picture. You've got, you've got two stacks here. 
You've got the white temple, as, as they call it. If you Google this, oftentimes it's referenced as the black temple and the white temple, or the black synagogue and the white synagogue, because th- this newer version was made out of white limestone. But it's built on top of the black basalt foundation of the original temple. So where we pick up in our story today is we pick up with Jesus, who's going to be preaching a sermon. He's going to be preaching a sermon in his own town, a town called Capernaum. And we know that, that there's a synagogue there, because I can, I can point you to it, that this synagogue of black basalt, Jesus would have stood right on top of that synagogue, and preach the very sermon that we're going to hear today. This is not a fairy tale. This is a real event happened in a real place. Real things happen in real places, and they can be checked by facts based on that location. And that all lines up and points us to what Jesus is going to tell us today. So we're going to be looking in John 6, and I'm going to pull out my Bible to read along as well, because I didn't put all the Scripture up here, and I just want to say beforehand that this is a, a, a very sort of scripture heavy kind of last part of the sermon here for you guys. And there's a lot of weird things in this. It's okay for the Bible to be weird, it's okay for us to think that the Bible is weird. Now, specifically, this one is super, super weird, and it gets kind of weird. Jesus kind of takes it to a weird, almost like gross place. And what I want you to keep in mind is as Jesus is giving this sermon, He's talking to a bunch of, he's not talking to, I mean, the Jewish leaders are listening. There's, there, there, there is no, like, I'm a Christian, I'm not a Christian. I'm a Christ follower, I'm not a Christ follower. We really pride ourselves here that we at South Point Church want to create a safe environment for all people to come to Jesus or for all people to have an encounter with Jesus. So we try really hard to make sure everyone feels safe as they have an encounter with Christ. Meanwhile, Jesus, that's the Holy Spirit backing me up for everything I'm saying. Amen, Jesus. Meanwhile, what would y'all do every time I said the word Jesus, that happened? (laughs) Who's buying lottery tickets? All right. (laughs) My wife will be so disappointed in me. Okay, so Jesus is preaching this sermon, and, and as he's preaching this sermon, he's preaching to normal people. This is not a sermon that's being preached to uh, like a super spiritual, super grounded group of people. And in fact, he's not even saying things that anyone has heard before. New content, new crowd. And this crowd actually comes for kind of the wrong reason and the wrong motivation. So what's happened up to this point is Jesus has just fed 5,000 people. He's just fed the 5,000 men. On top of that, there were women, there were children, lots of people around. Jesus fed them with a handful of fish and loaves. He multiplied the food. Then after that, Jesus sends the disciples on, and Jesus stays, and he goes up onto a hill, and he prays. And then he goes, and he walks on water out to the disciples in a boat in the Sea of Galilee. And then that's when Peter gets out and walks with Jesus. And then from there, they, they make their way over to Capernaum. And now that they're in Capernaum, a crowd hears about Jesus being there, and they gather around Jesus. Now, Jesus, he knows why they're there, and Jesus just calls them out for it right from the beginning. And he, sa- he says this in John 6, 26, he says, Jesus, he answers the people. He says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, you have been searching for me, not because you saw signs attesting to miracles, but... Because you ate the loaves and you were filled. See, so he he knows that they've not come to him because he's a miracle worker and can multiply food. They came to him because he can multiply food and they're hungry. See, See the difference between the two? They could care less about the miracle maker. They just wanted the food. Now the whole rest of Jesus' sermon is going to have to do with food. It's all going to be connected. So if you're hungry, I'm sorry. It's all about bread. And so they've come to Jesus asking for more bread because he's given them bread. And that's why he kind of confronts them with this right here. And everything you see in red, those are Jesus' words. And in fact, I don't have this verse for you, but the next verse that Jesus says is he says, Do not work for food that perishes, but instead for food that endures 
and food that leads to eternal life. And then he goes on to say, which the Son of Man will give you, for God the Father has authorized him to do that. So Jesus is saying, okay, you've come to me for food. Don't do it for snacks and junk. Instead, look for the food that's going to lead you to eternal life. That's really going to help you. And so he, 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 he tells them this, and then they ask him the question. They want to know. So they say, okay, that sounds great. That sounds wonderful. But how do we actually know how to do that? And, and that's what they ask him in verse 34 here. And they'll put that on the screen for you there. And in verse 34, they said to him, Lord, we want you to always give us that bread. You know, if you're saying, ask for the bread that gives eternal life, you mean I can eternally be satisfied? Okay, I'll take that. I want you to always give me that. So Jesus' answer to them in verse 35 is, he says, Okay, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry, and the one who believes in me as Savior will never be thirsty, for you will be sustained spiritually. See, again, we, Jesus is sticking with this bread theme here. And this is where I think it starts to get a little bit weird. It starts to get maybe hard to believe for people. Because Jesus has just said, Hey, if you're hungry, come to me and you'll never be hungry. You'll never be thirsty again. You know, I, I, I don't think that there's a food on earth that can do that. That, that can give you just infinite energy and infinite uh, electrolytes. You know, that, that's what we're trying to engineer if we have any distance runners or, or distance cyclists, you know. If there was something that you could eat and it would just give you infinite electrolytes, that would be amazing. And so just remember, Jesus is not talking to a bunch of Christians. He's talking to a bunch of normal people that have seen him multiply food. And so he starts talking to them about how there's an eternal food. And they start saying, we think we kind of want that. And then that's when Jesus says, well, it's, it's me. I'm the one that comes. And if you take of me, you'll never be hungry and you'll never be thirsty again. Now, this is kind of a, a crazy claim, right? Does it, I mean, if you put yourself in their shoes, this is starting to sound a little bit bananas. And because of that, the, the Jewish leaders at the time, they speak up. And in verse 41... They give their opinion to this whole thing. And they say, now the Jews murmured. So the Jews were the ones that were, were in charge of the temple, which is where Jesus is giving this sermon. And the Jews, they murmured. I like that word murmured, meaning it's like they, uh, our, our four-year-old does this, our three-and-a-half-year-old does it. He murmurs. When he doesn't get what he wants, he knows that if he complains, he'll get in trouble. He won't, really won't get what he wants. But he just wants to make sure that we know that he's not happy with the decision that we've made. So he, he murmurs under his breath. And you'll just hear him just... You know, he sounds like a creaky door or like a dying bird. We're like, Benjamin, don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear the wine. Don't want to hear it. That's him murmuring. That's like what the, what the Jewish leaders were doing. is Not quite bold enough to just say it out loud, but aggravated enough that they're just going to make sure that everyone knows that they're not quite happy with what's going on here. And so they murmured and they found fault with Jesus. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down out of heaven. That, no, that makes sense to me. It really does. You've got a crazy guy that says that he has the power to multiply bread. And then now he's saying, I'm the bread that came down out of heaven. Just partake of me. You know, that gets them a bit upset here. And then they go on in verse 42 and and they said, they just kept saying, is this not, so Jesus says that he's the bread that came from heaven. But that doesn't make sense to them because they say, is, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now have the arrogance to say, I have come down out of heaven? He says, Jesus, we know your daddy. You didn't come from heaven. You came from him. We know your mom. You didn't come from heaven. You came from her. You, you're just like us. You're a regular dude. You came out just like us. You put your toga on, you know, one shoulder at a time, just like us. You are just like us. How are you so arrogant to say that you came down from heaven? So they say this in the middle of his sermon. I appreciate you guys not interrupting my sermon like this. 
Jesus was really dealing with, we, we, I think I deal with a tough crowd sometimes. When y'all are tired or something, you know, Casey's like, how was Sunday? Oh, it's kind of a tough crowd, you know, they were a little bit sleepy. But at least I don't have you guys, you know, telling me like, you know, who do you think you are, you know, Mr. Guy? So thank you for that. Anyway, the story goes on here. After they've said this right here in, in, in verse 42, uh, just to touch on a little bit here, you know, it, it, Jesus just tells them, hey, stop murmuring among yourselves. Just stop it. Same thing I tell Benjamin. Benjamin, stop. And Jesus looks at them and says, Jewish leaders, stop it. Just stop murmuring. And then in verse 48, he kind of unpacks even more what he is, especially in relationship to bread in, 40, uh, in 48, and I'll back up and read verse 47 for you guys. It says, I assure you and I most solemnly say to you, he who believes in me is Savior. So whoever trusts and relies on me, Jesus, and has faith in me already, well, they're going to have eternal life. That is that they now possess eternal life. And then verse 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The living bread which gives and sustains life. Then in verse 49, your fathers, they ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. See, Jesus says he's relating bread to something that they can understand. He says, okay, the manna that fell from heaven that God gave to your forefathers as they wandered through the desert. If you ate that manna and you're still alive, raise your hand. And no one raised their hand. He says, exactly, because they're all dead. See, even that bread that you think fell from heaven, which was given by God to sustain them, did not give them the eternal life. Don't follow me around because you want bread. Follow me around because I can be your source for eternal salvation. That I can save you from being eternally separated from God. Now, this is a concept that just blows the minds of the Jewish leaders, and it just blows the minds of everyone that's hearing Jesus give this sermon. So then he goes on in, in verse 50, he continues to unpack this for them. He says, this is the bread that comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. I am. Jesus makes that definitive statement. I'm the living bread that came down out of heaven. And he even then goes on, and then he says, and this is where it starts to get really kind of, this is where it gets weird. And, and this is where it gets even harder to believe. It, it continues in this, it says, if anyone eats of the bread, so Jesus says he's the bread, and then he says, if you eat of the bread, it's like, okay, wait a minute, what's he talking about? See, we glaze over this stuff all the time because we were raised with it. But if you've never heard this, and if it's said for the first time ever, and someone stands up here and says, I am eternal life. Now, if you eat me, you can have eternal life. That's a bit weird. It's a bit uh, off-putting, as we could say. So Jesus says, if you eat of this bread, if you believe in me, accept me as your Savior, you'll live forever. And the bread that I will give you for, for eternal life is my flesh, my body. So Jesus says, I'll give you my flesh to eat. And that's when we see in, in verse 52, you can see that the Jewish leaders have a real problem with this. And they, they say in, in 52, it says, Then the Jews began to argue with one another. Now they're not murmuring. Now they're arguing. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And if you think about it, it's kind of interesting because, the, I mean, that's a true thing to consider. Remember, Jesus is not preaching to you who've been to church every Sunday for however long you've been coming to church. Jesus is preaching to just a crowd of people that, that were fed by him and followed him around for more food. And so they're hungry. They've got food on their mind. So Jesus says, okay, fine. Here's my flesh. Eat my flesh. And that should sound weird to us, and it does sound weird to them, and it really sounds weird to the Jewish leaders, and they're actually kind of worried about it, because they're like, how can he say those things? And then in verse 54, Jesus responds back to them, and he says, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, man, blood. It, who gets sick when you think, when, does anybody pass out when they see the side of blood? No, you guys are a tough crowd, for sure. 
Uh, I had a friend that, that did that. When he saw blood, he would pass out. He worked for me I, when I ran a construction company. And anytime one of us, you know, nicked a finger or something or an arm and we were bleeding, we would chase him around and be like, Logan, look at this, you know. And he would just turn white and just fall down. He would just completely hit the ground. Um, so Jesus is saying, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood believes in me and accepts me as Savior. He's saying that's what it means if you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. That's the context of what those words are. They will have eternal life. That is now they will possess eternal life. And I will raise them up from the dead on the last day. Now, I just want you to know that I don't have time to unpack the theology behind this. And I'm actually not trying to. That, that's not the setup for today. The setup for today is, is, is I want you to understand that sometimes Jesus says things and the Bible says things that are hard to swallow and that they're hard to believe in and they're hard to understand. And you don't have to believe in them. You don't have to understand them. But I want you to know that they're true and that they really happened and that we can actually show you the places where these things actually happened. And so Jesus has just given them this sermon about eternal life, but he's presented it in a way that talks about his body being flesh and blood. And he's saying, if you eat and you drink of my flesh and blood, you have eternal life. And that's a hard thing to understand. In fact, it has a really negative repercussion, something that I would be mortified about. And, and, and we see this in verse 59 here, as Jesus tells us, he said these things in a synagogue while teaching. Remember, he's preaching. And then when many of his disciples heard this, so it would be like you got the people that follow him, that know him, they said, this is difficult. This is harsh. This is offensive, these things that you're saying. Who can be expected to even listen to this? And then in verse 66, look at what happens. As a result of this, many of his disciples abandoned him, and they no longer walked with him. See, th th this is the moment in their lives where they made the decision that this was a fairy tale. This wasn't real, and it couldn't be real. This was an absolute fairy tale. I can't, I can't believe that if I eat this guy's flesh, or I drink his blood, or all these things that he's saying, like, this, is, this isn't, it's too much for me. So they made it through the miracles. They made it through, you know, Jesus healing people, walking on water, multiplying food, doing all these amazing things. And then they come to him and they ask him for more bread. And then he offers them something that would be good for their eternal soul. But it's just too much for them to wrap their head around. And so they turn and they walk out and they walk away. And see, the place where we can relate to this is that it's... It, in every single one of us, there's a line. There's things about Jesus that we understand, and there's a lot of things that we'll never understand. And you have a line in you somewhere that you say, I can follow Jesus up to a point. But then as soon as it crosses this line, then I, it becomes a fairy tale for me. I'm going to choose not to follow. And if I call it a fairy tale, that means that I don't have to apply the moral of the story to my life. It means that I don't have to, to, to take the takeaway that's supposed to make my life better, make me better at life. I don't have to apply that either because it's a fairy tale. It's good advice, and it can just stay good advice. See, the people that Jesus was preaching to, they hit that line, and they said, I'm over, and I'm done. This is too much for me. And then after they leave, see, it wasn't, all the, it wasn't the 12 that left. Jesus had... Tons of disciples that followed him. And a lot of them left. But Jesus turns and he looks at the twelve. And in verse 67 he says this to them. He says, you do not want to leave too, do you? So this is where he's questioning his inner twelve. He watches all these people go. I mean, I would be, as a teacher, mortified. If halfway through my message all but twelve of you got up and left... I, you know, I, I may look at the 12 and say, well, go on, you know. Don't you want to also get out of here? But see, Jesus has got this teaching, this fact, this reality. 
that he can offer eternal life. See, we know it's true because we know how the story ends. We know Jesus gives his life. We know Jesus dies on the cross. We know that there's heaven. We know about the Holy Spirit. We take communion. When we take communion, guess what we're doing? We're drinking of his blood. We're eating of his flesh. There's those two horribly scary words again. But the point is that Jesus gave his body for us. It was broken on the cross for us. And yes, he did bleed. There was bloodshed for the sake of our sins. See, before Jesus, for sins to be forgiven, a sacrifice had to be slaughtered. And there had to be bloodshed that would fall on the altar in order for that forgiveness to happen. And Jesus gave his body with his blood as that sacrifice. But see, when Jesus is preaching this sermon, they don't know that that's going to happen. But we do. See, we have the upper hand, the advantage to say that this is not a fairy tale. This is real. And I want to let something that's real have a real impact in my life. This is a real event. So when Jesus asks them, do you guys also want to leave? This is what Peter goes on to say here in, in the next verse. Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You are our only hope. To whom shall we go? See, Peter understood something that I hope you understand. Peter understood that if I leave you, Jesus, that means I've got to go and follow somebody somewhere. So who, am I, who else am I going to go to? I've seen what you do. I don't understand what you're talking about. But to whom shall I go? And so they stayed with Jesus. Now, for those of you that, that the Bible and maybe even this message has pushed you way over your line, and now this whole thing is entered into fairy tale land, then I, this message is your invitation. It's your invitation to kind of pull back and think, okay, this is proven. This is it's resourced. It's geographically proven. It's, it's been dug, dug up. The sermon is there. The examples are there. And we know that, that what Jesus says to these people is true because we know that Jesus does die on the cross and he does rise three days later and he does ascend into heaven. And so this is your opportunity to claim a, as an invitation to, to think about considering that this Jesus thing is not a fairy tale. And because it's real, it can have a real positive impact on your life. And for those of you that are Christ followers, and maybe you're wavering, maybe life is hard, and you're in a situation where you're wondering, where is Jesus? Jesus talks about all this eternal greatness, but where is it in my life? And I hope that for you today, this is a bit of assurance for you. This is your assurance that what you're believing in is good for you to believe in and it's true and it's irrefutable and it's not a fairy tale jesus died on the cross he gave his body he spilled his blood so that he could be that sacrifice for us so that we could have infinite access to god so that we're restored in the eyes of god we have no more sin we are clean as snow we are forgiven eternally that's the eternal life jesus talks about come to me Eat of me, drink of me, it means accept that I sacrificed myself for you. All you have to, like Holly up here, they got baptized. She came up to me last Sunday and said, I want to give my life to Jesus. She ate of his flesh, she drank of his blood, she got dunked, and she set for life, eternity with Jesus. I hope that more of you catch that. We're going to bring the band out. They're going to lead us in a, a, about a song and a chorus, and um, it's a beautiful song. And, and this is a moment for you guys to really just kind of create an opportunity. I want to create an opportunity for you to just worship God in this moment. And so I'm going to pray for us before they do that. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for, uh, for the words that you've just given and, and for the words that you've spoken. And, and I pray, Father, for the things that people have heard. But Lord, I pray that in every person that can hear my voice, that there's that line that they have where they think, is this real or is this a fairy tale? I pray, Father, that that line just gets nudged a little bit and that people are, are, are encouraged to say, you know what, this, maybe this isn't a fairy tale. Maybe this is real. And because this is real, I can start applying this stuff to my life. I can start applying this stuff to my day, applying this stuff to my situation. 
So Jesus, I pray that you move and you work and you do something amazing in people's hearts as we sing and we worship you. We pray this in your name, Father. Amen. You got